first thing we'd like to do is, uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, two uh, our two new uh, uh, public members, uh, T.J. McDowell and uh, Beatrice Stewart. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you for serving. Next thing we'll do is uh, we'll take roll call. Got, uh, Jackie Cooper, uh, absent. Richard Davila, absent. Uh, Dr. James Fowler, absent. Gary Hahn, absent. TJ McDowell, absent. <coughs> Jesse Rangel, present. Petra Stewart, Here. Amy Trost, Present. And myself, Ben Norris. Dave Kemp, correct? Okay, I'm going to move to item, uh, agenda item C, approve the minutes from, from the meeting of July 26, 2017. Do I make a motion to approve the minutes? Do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So carried. Okay, to move to agenda item B, public comment. Do we have any public comment? Okay, we have no public comment. Okay, due to one of our um, uh, members having to leave early, um, we're moving agenda item G uh, to, the, to the front. Uh, so we'll go directly to item number G. Discussion and possible recommendations regarding proposed changes to the rules. Uh, there you go. Wendy. Good morning, Wendy Pello, Assistant General Counsel. Uh, the proposed rules you have in front of you, um, again, is agenda item G. Uh, we're making two different types of changes in this pro rule proposal. Uh, one of those is um, due to House Bill 4007 and House Bill 1543 that passed this past legislative session. Um, the other category of changes we're making are cleanup changes that have been identified by um, department staff um, over the course of this, a little over a year now since the program had transferred from DSHS to TDLR. As we've worked with these rules and um, administered them, um, we've identified some issues that need some cleanup. So when you look at your rule package, um, you can see those two categories and then the rules that fall under, under each of those. I'll quickly walk through um, the rules. A lot of this is cleanup, so it should move fairly quickly. Um, but please feel free at any time to jump in and ask questions or make comments or changes. Um, in addition to your rule packet, you have um, copies in your materials of House Bill 4007, House Bill 1543, and a position paper that was um, sent to the department um, from the Texas Hearing Aid Association related to um, a statutory change that was made by House Bill 4007 relating to the temporary training permit. And when we get to those areas of the rules, we can um, discuss that as well. So we jump into um, the rules. When you turn to page two, you have definitions. And actually, the two um, definitions that are being amended are numbers 22 and 25 on page four of your draft. And we're removing um, definition 22, ownership of dispensing practice. Um, the provision in the statute um, regarding ownership of dispensing practice and um, those who own also have to hold the license. That provision was removed from the statute, so we no longer need this definition. Um, moving to what was definition 25, selling a hearing instrument by mail. That is a provision that was also removed from the statute. Um, due to House Bill 4007, so we're removing that definition. We don't need it any longer. And then the, with those two definitions being removed, the rest are being renumbered. Any questions or comments on definitions? Okay. Moving to page 
5 of the draft, um, 112.10 membership. Um, this is under uh, what is 2A, uh, the requirement that the advisory board or um, one member of the advisory board who's the, on the Texas Medical Board, having been a resident of the state for at least two years preceding, that has been removed, and that's a statutory change made by House Bill 4007. So we're making the corresponding change in the rules. Uh, section 112.21 examination um, qualifications. Uh, these are cleanup changes, um, just stylistic changing capitalized jurisprudence exam to lowercase. So you'll see that through various sections. Um, subsection F on that same rule under page six um, is cleanup. We're saying all applicable requirements because we were referring to both permit and licensing. And then that last sentence about extending the period. Um, this is not applicable and it's in the wrong place for this rule, so we're removing it. More questions? Um, still on page six, uh, section 112.22, exam test and contents. These are cleanup changes, and you'll see A is again the jurisprudence exam, subsection B. Um, we're clarifying um, who's developing the practical exam. The practical exam is developed by the department, but it's then administered by the department's designee. <coughs> And the same under what's B3 with the jurisprudence exam. If you turn to page seven, you get to that list under C with the, with the examination, the topics, and it's C12. Uh, we've changed post counseling to counseling to match the statute. Th this list is straight out of the statute, so we wanted to make that correction. Any changes or comments? Okay, still on page seven, one twelve point twenty three examination scores and results. Uh, subsection A, we're just making a clarification that that exam, what the department considers that exam is actually the written practical and jurisprudence, and then we're clarifying that it's all parts for and that for each of those parts you have to pass seventy percent. It's not um, a combined score. Um, and again, on B, designating it's the department of the department's designee will de de um, notifying the applicant about them. Um, their scores, and then lowercase jurisprudence. All right, moving on to 112.24 failure exam. Um, this is due to House Bill 4007, and um, this is saying that the, the applicant, if they fail their exam, um, they do retake it, but they have to hold either a current temporary training permit or the out-of-state license or to retake that the failed portion or portions of the exam. Um, this is a uh, we've added the part about the out-of-state licensees because under um, House Bill 4007, they removed that part of the statute for out-of-state applicants who came in and took the exam and failed it, that they had a, they couldn't retake it and they had to start completely over as a temporary training permit holder. So now that that um, prohibition has been removed from the statute, um, we've made that corresponding change here in the rules. Any other changes or comments? Um, bottled page seven on to page eight, 112.26 jurisprudence exam. This is a cleanup change. Um, again, these are all references changing the um, uppercase jurisprudence exam to lowercase. Any other comments? Uh, page eight, um, 112.30 hearing and fitter and dispenser license. These are cleanup changes. And you see just under C, just we're clarifying that the fee required is the initial application fee. Simple cleanup there. On page 9, 112.32, um, these are um, hearing instrument fitter and dispenser license, the license term and renewals. He's made some cleanup changes. What you'll see under C2 and then the new D, um, we were removing from the list successfully passing criminal history background check, but you have to, um, and in moving it down to D, um, there had been some questions because of hearing instrument fitters are licensed. When you apply for a license, you have to submit your fingerprints and goes through the FBI background check, um, having the, saying you have to s successfully pass a criminal history background check, um, raise questions of, well, do I have to resubmit my fingerprints? And the answer is no. Once you've submitted your fingerprints, you're in the system, and we get notified by the FBI um, on what they're called wrap back reports if there's been a change in the criminal history. So um, you still have to pass a criminal history background check, but you don't have to do anything proactively um, in submitting um, fingerprints. So that's what that clarification is on C2 and D. Any other questions or comments in this section? All right, moving to page 10, 112.33, application by license holder from another state. Um, when you look down on D2, again, this is another change made by House Bill 4007. 
Um, this was a requirement that was in the statute and has been removed that the license, that the out-of-state license holder had to have held the license for at least three years preceding the date of application. So we've made a corresponding change in our rules. And then under 6D, um, this is cleanup. They've always had to, pay, they're applying for a full license, they've always had to pay the application fee, but realized it was missing from, from the rules. So just to clean up and reflect the practice and the requirements under the statute. Um, turning to page 11, top of page 11, subsection E, and again, this is reflecting that the um, applicant for a hearing instrument fitter license from out of state has to submit the fingerprints um, as well, and that's a, and this is again a statutory requirement. They're applying for a license, they must be fingerprinted. This is what's happening, but we just wanted to put the public on notice that it's having that requirement here. And then what was subsection um, H, and that's being struck in the middle of the page. Um, this is the provision I was mentioning earlier about the um, out-of-state applicant failing the exam and the prohibition of them being able to retake the exam and the fact that they have to start over since that's been removed from the statute. It's being removed now from the rules as well. Questions or comments? Um, still on page 11, 112.40, application, uh, apprentice permit, application eligibility requirements. These are cleanup changes, and it just shows up on page 12 under 5, again, a jurisprudence exam, lowercase. 112.42, apprentice permit, permit the term and extension. Um, subsection A is a, um, is a cleanup change, I'm just saying, um, because they can't, Extend, they can only extend it for an additional year, but it can't be extended more than once. Um, that cleanup is being put in there. Um, the new subsection C, again, putting folks on notice that they have to um, submit a background check. And for the permit holders, they're not doing a um, fingerprint background check as a name and date of birth, and they go through that on their initial um, application. But this was an extension, which was similar to, in some ways to a renewal, so we are um, putting folks on notice that there's a background check for the extension as well. Any comments, questions? Okay. Uh, page 12, uh, section 112.50, the temporary training permit. Um, these are changes um, as a result of House Bill 4007, and this is also the, the I think, the provision that um, THAA was commenting on in terms of that <coughs> section in the statute about 402.251B. Um, the change, um, the statute in part um, removed the prohibition that the, someone who's applying for a temporary training permit holder must have never taken the exam before. So that provision was removed from the statute. We had a similar provision in our rules, so we removed that under C1. The statute also had a um, waiting period of 365 days that if their um, previous permit um, they could extend it once, but if it, after that point, then they had to sit out 365 days and it couldn't uh, be renewed or extended. Um, that was removed from the statute. We didn't have a similar provision in our rule, so there's nothing to strike. Um, the bill, um, House Bill 4007, when they changed the statute, it did allow for the, um, the commission by rule to um, establish rules regarding a reissue of a temporary training permit. Um, the department did not draft any new rules in terms of um, waiting periods or additional requirements. Um, based on the way our rules are drafted, we believe that um, once they've extended it once, they get the temporary training permit for one year, they are allowed to extend it once. At that point, if it expires, then they could just start all completely over and apply for a new permit. This is, um, and this is where the position paper from THAA was commenting, um, was re um, recommending having a specific waiting period. And they were recommending six months. The department hadn't made any changes, but open that up for uh, Jesse Rangel. So I, I understand this is <clears throat> making it easier for people to get into the industry, but this is just allowing that person to keep on running through the system, going through the system over and over again and a lot of these employers are going to continue to use that same person in some type of way maybe not licensed for a year but they'll be doing something eventually get try to get licensed one more time is that something that we're wanting to do well 
the department when we had, uh, we had talked about the depart uh, the the comment letter um, to us we weren't clear necessarily on what how big if this is a problem how big how often is this is happening and maybe the reasons for this um, is this an issue the um, the temporary training permit holder is not passing the exam do they need more training is it an issue about the quality and nature of the training be provided at this point we were not putting any type of restriction on that in terms of somebody being reapply and and is this something that's already been changed or is this something that we're still talking about wanting to change well these are yeah these are proposed rules we had not put any proposed any rules and that the provisions in the statute that um, about the 365 day waiting period has been removed and that is effective so there isn't any uh, waiting period now so as, as soon as they fail they can sign right back up and they're right back at doing their same job again as soon as they as, as soon as they fail fail they say, say their practicum and, and, and they don't pass their test there's no waiting 365 days uh, they're they're able to just fill out their paperwork pay their money and continue working at that same place and basically fit here in AIDS right if the if their um, permit has not expired yes and uh, Mary Winston Mr. Engel as Wendy was saying this is statutory right this the statute has changed it's taken the 365 days what the statute now allows is for the department and uh, the Commission by rule may adopt rules about let me pull up the specific language um, it may adopt rules for issuing another temporary training permit and putting what those restrictions if any or what the conditions would be about issuing a permit so the 365 days is gone from the statute Okay, but uh, this is Ben Norris. Uh, so the question is, is that uh, uh, it's gone from the statute, but that, that leaves the window open to set a rule uh, if it wanted to be 365 days, correct? Well, it allows the commission by rule to, um, let me pull the particular language up. The commission by rule may provide for the issuance of a new temporary training permit under this section after a person's temporary training permit expires. Okay. So that's the guidance we have. Right. Um, yeah, the concern, I, I, and, and I guess I, you know, um, the concern is if somebody is, is operating under a temporary training permit, which is a process of learning the, the uh, procedures, test procedures, fitting, dispensing, and hearing aids, and they go a year, uh, and then they go in an extension, so they're a year and a half into it, uh, and then they can't pass the test, uh, written or practical test. The concern is, is they're working with the public of Texas, uh, and um, they didn't uh, adequately learn how to do that for the safety of the public. Uh, so that's the concern. Uh, so I don't know that I could support not having a time uh, after that license lapse. So mm -hmm. that's the concern. May I say yes, ma'am. And, and I'm new, so me uh, go ahead and state right your name. Before uh, this is Deetra Stewart, right. and and I guess this is a question. So, unlike many other professions, there's not a lot of colleges or universities or education you can get. So you're pretty dependent on supervision of whoever you're working under. So in order to work with a patient, you are working under someone else's license, right? So let's say you take the test, but you don't pass all of it, okay? And you, your time is exhausted, so you no longer have a license. If there's a 365-day period where you can't do that, then you're not able to practice at all. And so if there's a training issue, there's such a lapse in information that you can give because you're not able to have interaction with patients which I, I guess I look at it differently because as as a newbie so to speak you are working under someone else's license so that responsibility is on that person and because it is a training issue if I need more information or training okay 
I can do that if I have a temporary permit. But if you take away my permit, I can't have anything to do with patients, so to speak. Is, is that the way that it works? Uh, that is. The, the, the thing is, is on, like I said, it, the responsibility of a licensed person to sponsor somebody, uh, it's their responsibility to train that person and get that person uh, to the point to be able to pass the test and all this. In the meantime, that person uh, is, is, is working with the public, uh, and there's a period of hours uh, that uh, they would do that under direct supervision. After that, they can be put in an office all by themselves. Uh, and they, they have uh, several times to be able to take that test in that year and a half period. Uh, and and uh, so that's the concern. And then if they're not able to accomplish that, uh, then just to fill out the paperwork, get another license, and continue to do that is the concern. <coughs> so, so the responsibility of the sponsor, it's there in, in, you know, if you took a percentage, in my opinion, let's say you took 100 people, you may have 99 that go through that process very well, but that one person doesn't, there's a concern there. I know, I'm just looking at, at that, from, okay. from a training perspective and from a clinical perspective, yes, you, you do have to have a license to interact with patients, but it's also very important to be able to get information, and there's some information that you can't get unless you are interacting with patients, okay? So I guess my question is, are you able to still interact with patients and not have a license? Because if this is a training issue, I still need to get my clinical skills up, and the only way that I can do that is interacting with and, and testing patients. Under supervision, that's the key. Un under supervision is, is one thing, and I'm, I'm really not sure what this is actually saying right here, uh, but to me it seems like if they run out of time and and now they don't have to wait 365 days they're able to pay their fees and immediately uh, they're back to practicing all over again um, are they going to be coming back in with direct supervision are they going to be able to go in and just start fitting and dispensing uh, and 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 somewhere someone has to take responsibility and I really don't see that it's the business owner that's taking that responsibility. That they're just allowing that person to come right back on and start feeding hearing aids again because that's what they need. They need they need someone there working for them. And and I'm I'm all for good training, but there's a lot of people out there that don't look at it that way. They look for that year and a half time to use this person and pay them probably cheap wages or whatever and and at the end of their time, if they don't pass, they just grab someone else and let's start over again. So, and, and, so, someone needs to take more responsibility, and I don't think the business owner is taking that responsibility. We're making it easier for them to use that person on and on and on and on. So isn't it, to me, kind of like um, punishing the person who needs to learn? Because if stipulations say that you're working under my license, I have a responsibility to make sure you know what you're doing or I'm liable for that. I'm a respiratory mm -hmm. therapist and so I, I kind of look at it. I remember when all of the, the changes came about and people who had been working in the field many years could not pass the test. And, and I'm just kind of correlating this. If there were a period of time, okay, you can't work with patients, you can't do anything. But at least there's schools you can go to for this. You're very limited in how you can get knowledge in this field. But I do think that whoever is supervisors, and please, again, correct me if I'm wrong because I'm new, they have a responsibility to ensure that people are adhering to <coughs> the protocols of the field. Mm -hmm. Well, no. uh, yeah, but there has to be a degree. How long can you do, how long can you do that? Do you do it for 15 years? Do you do it for 20 years? You got to have some kind of standard to go, you know, hey, enough is enough. 
you know, and it's and when we say that, it's either the owners or whatever in the for statute and rule, you have to apply it to the requirements of licensure, my opinion. Uh, so that's that's where the yeah, it stands. Somewhere you have to put a limit to say, okay, you can go out there and practice for a year, two years, three years, five years. Do you let it go on and on and on, just calling it a training issue? You know, it, I guess it's... Um, you, know, you can relate it to other licenses. You have requirements to meet, and as a student going into it, they have a responsibility. Yes, you have a supervisor and a trainer, uh, but somewhere the knowledge is not getting there. And so do you go, well, it's still a training issue, so let it go on and on and on, and that's the concern. So putting a limit on it is, is you know, to a point to where you can go you know, two years and you're not adequate enough to pass that test, then the concern is is uh, for the, uh, uh, you know for the safety of the public, and so that gives that person the incentive to either learn it, do it, pass the test, or move on to another career, move on to something else. So, yeah. for yeah. oversight and in, in again, I'm a newbie, mm -hmm. but I'm also a sign language interpreter, and I know that. Companies that continue to hire people who cannot pass the test, the agency is going to come and say, hey, 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 you're sending these people in healthcare settings. And so they have to answer to somebody, the person who is hiring them, because, I mean, it's really going to say about a lot about your practice or your business if you're hiring people who I would deem unqualified. So yes, while we are punishing the person who can't pass, whether it's a learning disability or a training issue or whatever, but somebody's got to look at what these businesses are doing because if they don't hire them, then what do we look at? You know Ma what I'm saying? Mary Winston, TDLR. Ben, were you thinking of, so Wendy, did we get any comments about the 365 day um, or did we even know that this was an issue before Mr. Rangel mentioned it about them being able to retest, retest? We do have the ability to draft rules. Were we thinking about another time period? Were we thinking? Well, and we had had these kind of discussions in terms of what is the issue? Is is, is and you're reflecting a lot of the kind of the discussions of is this a training issue? Is it a, a testing issue? Is it a supervision issue? Um, to be able to put in rules to address it, it's right now, um, I know we have, you know, one suggestion in terms of the position paid from THA is to make the temporary training permit holder have to sit out six months. But the question is, is what's the magic about six months versus one month versus 12 months? Is that the appropriate thing? You've raised some issues um, as well about having them sit out, that's not going to help in the training or advancing the knowledge. So having a, a, what the solution would be, whether it be a timing issue, additional training issue, that's not something we were, you know, prepared to have it, um, to propose some type of, you know, the way we're allowed to, the commission by rule to, you know, to um, provide for the issuance of a temporary training permit and put in rules, that's not something in the department was prepared to do anything on at this point, so I don't know if it's something that the advisory board would want to form a work group to look at those issues um, in terms of what the, the specific issue, I know you've raised some issues about maybe somebody's hiring people just to have somebody there, but um, maybe the supervision and the training's not happening. I mean, it could be a variety of reasons, so um, I don't want to propose a rule attempting to fix the problem that we're not quite clear on what the problem or the issues are. So it may be appropriate if you want to have a work group or to look at this issue separate from these, you know, from these rules and always come back and revisit this. And uh, Mary Winston again. And for our new members, um, <clears throat> we've kind of done a small work group right here <laughs> with discussing some issues. Mr. Rangel, you bring up something uh, in the industry. You guys are our industry uh, professionals, consultants, so to speak. You know what's going on. Um, we know the letter of the law. We know the black and white on the page. You're the public members as well. Work groups are members of the advisory boards, uh, non-quorum, um, because we then have to post it as a meeting. 
um, that can have discussions outside of the meeting, bring into that meeting the concerns, some of which you've addressed here, to kind of flesh out the issue and some possibilities. Um, as Wendy said, what is the magic number? Is it six months? Is it a year? Is it a supervision issue? What is the issue? The work group would come together and discuss this issue and maybe some real world implications of what goes on, bring in other knowledge that they have, and come back to the board and, and advisory board meeting with their findings for the advisory board to then have a better insight of what it's what the problem is. Is it a timing issue, is it a supervision issue or whatever? So this may be something and um, being as presiding officer this would be, uh, that presiding officer would appoint the work group and the work group would meet outside of this arena by phone. You don't have to come into to Austin um, working with a staff member to flesh this out without um, interrupting everyone's schedule because we know we have members who have to leave early and, and different things that are going on. So if that's something that uh, you want to consider, we can consider that as well. So, go ahead, Amy. I was going to, this Amy Trost, I was going to make a recommendation that, that we do put a work group together and discuss this further. Now, I, I have a question. You know, we're, we're working on uh, item number G, mm -hmm. uh, and this is a discussion, possible recommendation regarding proposed changes. Uh, are we looking to have a vote for? Uh, item G today on the proposed changes, which includes this particular one. We are. Um, we can, um, if the advisor board wants to you know, recommend changes um, for the rest of the rules, the, this section, this type of issue, sounds like we're going to need some additional discussion that it could come back and at a later date we can propose rules specific to that, you know, those, that provision of the statute. So it can be separated out, but um, our goal was to do today was to do for bill implementation timeline, um, get the rest of the, these changes published and out for public comment. Uh, okay, let me understand that. So, so you can say we can pull this particular 11250 out of the proposed change and put it toward a work group for further study. Um, I would re recommend that uh, the, the change for um, 112.50 still go because there's other cleanup changes in this. Um, we would just do a, a study, um, a work group study related to this rule and to the statutory changes to um, 402.251B that um, gave, that removed the 365 day provision and replaced it with the commission by rule, adopting rules. And we can do that as a separate action, but we can still do the cleanup here. Which at, which at that time later down the road would be a, a proposed rule change. Right. Uh, if if the, the um, work group and the advisory board decided to get, make that type of recommendation. And all of it, Mary Winston again, is going out for public comment. So uh, the comment we've had here, um, we'll have additional comment. We, we never know how much. Um, with some, <laughs> some of our programs, we have a lot, some of it, we're like, wow, we thought we have won. But it's out there, and I, I think we will get a lot of comment on this. So it going out for comment after it comes back, comes back to you guys. Uh, Wendy will parse through them, and um, you'll see all of them. Uh, if we have uh, um, several comments, I, We've had, how many have we had in the past? Like just a huge number. I don't think this will, this will be that issue, but we've had large comments before where we've had to separate them by type of comment. But we do all that sorting in house and we bring it all back to you and then we discuss that. And we may come up with some information on some of the issues we've discussed here just from the public comments, some suggestions, you know, for consideration. But it comes back here. It's not a, a final anything yet. It's just going, it would go for public comment. Okay, I'll move on. Okay. Um, any other discussion on 112.50? Um, 
back on page 13, uh, 11252. Um, this is the temporary training permit, permit ex extension. This, um, again, we didn't make any um, rule changes on, on the extension, um, kind of related to the, the discussion we just had on 112.50. Um, we did make a um, cleanup change at the top of page 14, that new subsection C. Again, since it is an extension, they also have to pass a criminal history background check. Clarification in there. Um, page 14, um, 112.53, the temporary training permit, the supervision and temporary training requirements. The ch only change, the change actually ends up on page 15, um, subsection I, and this is the supervisor and the permit holder um, shall submit um, verification of compliance um, to the department in a manner prescribed by the department. The statute had um, language in it that required that the, the party sign the form and that the form be notarized and mailed. Um, we like to try and do things electronically and <laughs> as, uh, make the submission as easy as possible. So the, this rule change uh, reflects that change in statute. Comments on that. Um, turning to page 16, um, 112.70. Um, we've done some um, House Bill 4007 changes and some cleanup changes under subsection B. Um, there is a whole discussion about two-year renewal periods and when it starts and when it ends. Actually, it's the continuing education is during your two-year license term, and so we've just clarified that. You don't actually have a two-year renewal period. So that we've kind of made that clarification in several of these subsections that it just, I think, it makes it easier, more, a little more user-friendly that it's 20 hours of continuing education during your license term. Um, so you see that in subsection cleanup in D and E. Um, subsection F about um, the license holder being able to take all three parts of the license exam and receive credit um, for the continuing education. That was a provision that was in the statute and that was removed by House Bill 4007. Um, page 17, what was was K, was now subsection J, and was subsection 1. It's being struck kind of right there in the middle of your page. Um, having the exceptions for the continuing education, um, if the member had served in the regular armed forces of the United States during any part of, t of that 24 hour months before the end of the renewal period, um, that was removed from the statute, House Bill 4007. It's removed because it's redundant. There's a whole chapter in the Occupations Code, Occupations Code Chapter 55, that deals with uh, military members, veterans, and spouses, and there's provisions in there um, related to um, continuing education and extending the time period for renewals, um, deals with late renewal fees, a variety of provisions. So it's already addressed um, elsewhere, um, and we have that also in our Chapter 60 rules that apply to all of our programs, so we don't need to repeat it um, in this particular set of rules. But do know that it still applies. And again, just changing references from two-year renewal period to license term. There are changes or questions on that. Um, page 17, 112.80 rules, cleanup changes. Um, hearing fitters and, uh, instrument fitters and dispensers um, program is one of uh, several health related programs that has a special provision in our Chapter 51, which is our Occupations Code Chapter 51, which is our enabling statute, and it addresses um, rules related to standard of care and scope of practice. And there's certain health related programs that are listed. This program is one of those. Um, we adopted, have adopted rules um, such that address those issues about how we go about proposing and adopting rules um, for those type of rules, those type of revisions, standard care and scope of practice. At the time when we had drafted these rules, um, the, the hearing fitters and dispenser rules, we didn't have the chapter 100 rules in place at that point. So we had placeholder language. So now this is, we have final adopted rules that that language has been replaced. Um, make a big jump over to page 19. The consumer information section has been amended to include client records, and this is a result of House Bill 1543 and the new provision under subsection B um, is a statement of um, what's in that, in that bill in terms of um, the licensee or the practice shall provide a client who provides a signed written request, a copy of the client's records that pertain to the testing for and fitting of or dispensing of hearing instruments. Um, 112.95, this is a cleanup change. Um, this language is to match the statute. So there's not any conflict there. Uh, still on page 19, 112.10 fees. 
um, that you jump over, and actually the change is on page 20, at the top page 20, subsection E. Um, we're removing the um, practical exam, the retake practical exam, the jurisprudence fees here. Those are not paid to the department. Um, typically, the department only puts fees that are paid to us in the in the um, our rules. At the time when the program was being transferred, DSHS was performing these exams, so we had to assume that we may be um, performing those exams as well. Um, we do have a third-party contractor who's performing those exams, so um, we've removed the specific fee amounts from our rules and just. Um, put the, the reader on notice that those written practical and jurisprudence exams are all set and payable to the third party, our designated third party. Changes. Um, Subchapter M, complaints right there in the middle of the page on 20, 112, um, point 112.120, complaints regarding standard of care. Again, now this is the replacement of the placeholder language with the adopted rules. Those rules also address um, standard of care complaints. Um, House Bill 112.130, Administrative Penalties and Sanction. This is a House Bill 4007 change. Um, we just had some cleanup change. The uh, statute, or th that bill was removing a lot of redundancy, so provisions, things like administrative penalties or sanctions, um, those are already covered, again, by our enabling statute, Occupations Code, Chapter 51, applies to all our programs. So one of the th things that House Bill 4007 did was remove program-specific administrative penalties, so they're all governed under our Chapter 51. So this is just some cleanup to identify Chapter 51 or 402, wherever it may be, those provisions may be found. And then under 112.133, civil penalty, again, this is a redundancy provision. We have this provision in our Chapter 51, so a program-specific provision was removed um, from this program, though the civil penalties can still apply under Chapter 51. Any questions or comments or suggested changes? At this point, we would be, um, unless there's any discussion or questions, we would be asking for a recommendation from the advisory board um, for the department to go ahead and um, uh, publish these uh, rules as proposed rules in the Texas Register and get um, public comment. Um, I do note that that one rule, um, 112.50, we would still propose it, but um, you may get public comments in the advisory board if you wish to have a work group can do that as well. Do I hear a motion? I make the motion to uh, move forward with the rule changes, um, except, you know, I believe that we should get a work group together to discuss that 112.50. But just to clarify your question, we'd still recommend the recommendation would right. still be to propose it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Can I have a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And so carried. Thank you all. <coughs> Okay, we'll now move to uh, agenda item E, the staff report, uh, license division. Good morning, advisory board members, Chairman North, Leonard Rivas with the licensing division. Um, in your packet, I included um, the licensing report for the number of new and renewed licenses issued uh, for fiscal year 2017 and for the first quarter of 2018. I'll be glad to answer any questions if you have any. Otherwise, that concludes my report. Have any questions? For the new members, do you have any questions or do you understand the report? Do you would like me to explain anything to you? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, we'll now hear uh, from General Counsel's Office. Wendy Pella, Assistant General Counsel. 
Um, for the general counsel report, we wanted to give you an update on a rulemaking petition that the department had received um, regarding uh, 16 Texas Administrative Code uh, Section 112.97 um, sound level measurements, um, audiometers, and audiometric testing. Um, you have a copy of the rule petition and follow up email um, that we received um, back on uh, August 15th and August 23rd, and then a copy of the department's response um, that was, we sent on October 13th, 2017. Um, with rulemaking, you may recall that through rulemaking petitions, um, when we receive, the department receives a rulemaking petition, we have to act within 60 days. Either we um, take action and start the rulemaking process, or we deny the petition and have to identify the reasons for that. Um, we set out um, a number of reasons in our letter um, trying to address the issues that were raised in the rulemaking petition. Um, we did deny the rulemaking petition, though we did note on one of the issues that was being raised um, related to the ANSI standards and the recommendation about putting that in. We denied it, but we said that we would, um, we thought it might be a significant change to the industry, so we wanted to seek additional input from the advisory board so late, um, to get further information and to research that issue more. And so later on in our agenda, another work group will have that issue for, for to be reassigned to a work group. Any other, any questions or anything about the rule petition or report? No. Nope. Thank you. All right, we're now here from uh, Enforcement Division. Good morning, Chairman Norris, Virginia Fields, board members. I'm a prosecutor with the Enforcement Division, and I'm here today to give you your report from enforcement. I apologize for my late entry. I was in hearing this morning, but I do, did want to be here to advise you of our current project within enforcement. We've consolidated the health-related and medical programs and are devoting two prosecutors, myself and my esteemed colleague, Karen Cox, to prosecute the hearing fitter dispensers, as well as speech language pathologists, orthotics, podiatry, and the midwife program. Uh, your report contains key statistics from 2018. Um, that shows basically uh, cases opened and resolved. I did have assistance this morning in getting updated information. We currently have seven open cases. Three of those involve license applications. Uh, four are consumer complaints. Of the uh, seven cases, one is currently in our investigation section, and six are under review and prosecution. That concludes my report. Karen and I look forward to working with you guys, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. We have any questions? No. Nope. Thank you very much. Thank you, board. All right, we'll move to Education and Examination Division. Good morning, Chairman Norris. Welcome to Advisory Board members. My name is Rebecca Adamas. I'm with TDLR's Education and Examination Division, and I'll be delivering you some information this morning. Um, at the time that our uh, report was submitted we didn't have our numbers from September so I'll go ahead and give those to you now we had uh, let's see 19 folks take the audiometric exam and we had a 74 percent pass rate for that and for the ear impression we had 16 folks take that exam and an 81 percent pass rate for that um, we do have an exam coming up on the 20th and uh, deadline to register is this Friday so um, we look forward to administering that next exam and that's all I have, if anybody has any questions for me. <laughs> all right. Any questions? How about the written exam? Do you have any? We don't have any data on that because that's collected by IHS. Yeah. Any others? Anything else? No, right. thank you very much. Okay. Okay, now we're here from Compliance Division. Good morning, I'm Katie Bryce with the Medical and Health Profession section of the Compliance Division, and I'll be giving the Compliance um, Report. Compliance staff have updated applications and forms to reflect the changes implemented by House Bill 4007. We've also submitted work orders to update information on the website to reflect these changes. 
um, our next opportunity for public outreach will be at the Texas Hearing Aid Association meeting in June in Dallas. We will have a booth at the conference and we'll look forward to seeing licensees there. Um, the medical and health profession section remains focused on maintaining the successful operation of phase one programs. We have been working with general counsel to review draft proposed rules and working with customer service to answer compliance related emails when they come in. Additionally, we have started to produce a newsletter called the Health Monitor, which has articles and information on the programs in the medical and health profession section. The first newsletter was published November 2nd, and you can find a link to it from the Hearing Instrument Fitters and Dispensers homepage. Um, I think we'll be planning on publishing that quarterly. So, um, Do I have any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll hear from uh, Customer Service Division. Good morning, Chair and Board members. Thank you for your service. Um, so, doing something a little new, so I'm a newbie as well. Uh, not to the agency, but to uh, giving reports uh, before the advisory boards. So, um, that's why I'm here today to introduce customer service and our a part in the agency and to give uh, a report on the statistics for, for your industry. Um, but before we get to numbers, I um, just want to talk a little bit about what we do. So we are a group of 50 uh, or so individuals in a tightly knit, fast-paced environment. Um, we take phone calls, we answer emails, we respond to uh, the social media posts over Facebook and Twitter. And we do a myriad of tasks. We uh, perform the, I think the, the, the best way to describe it is we are guides. We uh, help people connect to the resources they need internally uh, in the agency. Uh, we relate information back and forth between the external stakeholders and the internal uh, stakeholders to serve our customers and the citizens of, of the state. Um, so we ask a lot of questions. We do a lot of interviewing. We do our best to figure out what the issue is that needs to be resolved, and then we do our best to get that person the information they need or to the right individual to get that issue resolved as quickly as possible. Um, so we look pretty calm, we're pretty happy, uh, we like to laugh, we like to party, but we are like that duck on the water with our feet kicking fur furiously under the surface. Um, <clears throat> so I'll go over reports now just uh, really briefly. So the, the thing you'll notice is that there aren't a lot of phone calls or uh, emails uh, for the industry, but as a group, the, the programs that were formerly or now the health and medical professions group are uh, us becoming a significant portion of our contacts in the agency uh, and in the customer service division. They are handled as a group by our uh, team five. We have five teams of those 50 members I mentioned before. And that group is led by Don Robinson, is our team lead for that, uh, that group. And the manager is with me today. His name is Tuan Nguyen, and he's sitting in the back end. Um, we'll be reporting. Uh, both of them could possibly report on my behalf in the future uh, advisory board meetings, if I, should I not be available. Um, so I just wanted to take a quick. Uh, not quick, but I wanted to take a couple minutes, introduce you, uh, introduce ourselves to you, and uh, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you may have uh, about the division and our part in the agency's work. Jesse Rangel. Yes. Um, just something simple. Uh, customer service division, that's for all licenses, not just fitters? That is correct. So I'll, I'll expand a little bit on that. Um, we, of the 39 uh, industries, uh, is it 39 now or 41? <laughs> of all the industries we regulate at this point, um, we are the first point of contact for, for all of the industries. So uh, many customers, we're the only uh, experience they will have of the agency. Uh, they find what they need on the website, get their application done, and um, they are on their way. Uh, if they do need assistance, then yes, we are the first point of contact for everyone. And that keeps us extremely busy. We had over half a million contacts in the last fiscal year. Um, and um, it has been an interesting 20, uh, beginning of the fiscal year 2018. So uh, lots of challenges, lots of opportunities. Um, we're enjoying the, 
the ride and the and and doing our best to uh, catch up and keep up and stay on top of our service goals. Um, Mary industry. Winston, I always uh, pop in here because um, Trey has not implemented this into his uh, report um, because he should brag just a little bit more or maybe a whole lot more. Um, our customer service department is division is. How many contacts, Trey, last year? Over half a million contacts. Over half a million contacts. Um, emails, phone calls, um, walk-ins. Because customer service at our office downtown at the E.O. Thompson building, they handle the front desk. We do get walk-ins uh, for different industries. They are the first point of contact that comes in if they don't know it. Uh, they find that information. They disseminate that information. There's a board in there that lets you know um, who's on the call, how long they've been on the call, what issue it is, which team it is. It's, uh, that division is, is, is really a sight to see. They work hard and, and they do a great job. Um, maybe in developing this report, we see because your profession, this is very manageable when we look at the numbers here. Maybe if we uh, in, just grow this report and show in contrast, uh, sure. much as enforcement does, what the different, what this uh, profession does versus other professions and all that Trey's team handles. This is definitely one of our core competencies, our customer service division. They do a fantastic job, and we just weren't highlighting it. Um, we had a previous board uh, member say, uh, oh, it's current board member, different board, what else don't we know about TDLR? And we said, when we find out, we will let you know. Because it's something we just do. We know Trey handles this. He has his managers, his ombudsman. Um, we actually had a new staff member. Stephen, I'm going to call you out because he's here today. I'll call him out even if he's not here. <laughs> Stephen Mills came from another agency with, uh, and with great experience in, in the health care um, programs. And in just being a new person to the agency, he said, why aren't we highlighting customer service? Why isn't customer service making a presentation? The public doesn't know what they do. And I always Thanks, make Steven. just a <laughs> <laughs> little dig at the boss. Can't dig too hard at the boss. He's not here, and he has uh, deeper digging powers. Um, Brian said, you know what? Let's do this. Um, we coordinated with um, our chief of staff, Nick Valenis who uh, we all report to, um, what's the report going to look like, what story do we want to tell, and we wanted the public, we wanted our board members and everyone out there to know what we are doing, what this great team is doing, and they really handle a lot. And as his report grows, this looks, ah, oh, this is manageable. But when we had this report at another meeting where the phone calls, I can't remember which one, were more were just greater astronomical numbers, actually, from my perception, it was like, wow. Um, and they handle this with 50 people. And if you go into that room, you have to be quiet because they're all on the phone. <laughs> but are answering an email or we'll get something, can you help, help this customer? And they're just a part of uh, a, a thread running through the whole agency. So we wanted everyone to know that. And he even got a call from another presiding officer after making his first presentation yes. uh, with a question and it's like well now you're in for it they know your face they know your name <laughs> and and he's up for up for oh, the yeah. challenge so this is gonna be a part of every meeting um, he also can give you trends if there's a question in the industry um, if you think am I just having this question or is customer service getting phone calls or emails about this concern they know that and so they help the division and to help the agency uh, know what's going on out there by what type of calls that we're getting in our emails and questions because they run those trends and they run numbers and they have algorithms it, it's 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 very impressive so they do a lot and we wanted to share um, and commend Trey for the work of his team thank you Mary and to be fair to Stephen he wasn't the only one uh, oh, okay. working on me to uh, to make these presentations and they will they will grow so uh, and and that's what we do is we we do know the voice of the customer and we have the stories and I want to make sure that we um, share that information with everyone so it's very nice to meet you today and 
Um, That's me and you. Any Thank other you. questions? Um, nope. No? Okay. What's the trending question? For hearing fitters? Oh, oh across the board. Generally speaking. Generally speaking, mm -hmm. where's my license? It's typically, <laughs> it's typically okay. the top question. Yeah. Want to get to work. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that's what we do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We now have an uh, executive office report. Recent yeah. development. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, board members, I'm Nick Boinas of TDLR. And I uh, want to wish you a happy new year. Thank you for uh, being here today. And thank you for your service to the state of Texas. Um, here to bring you a uh, brief uh, uh, executive office report, a summary of what's been happening around the uh, agency. Um, wanted to, since your last meeting uh, in July, we have added a new, uh, very uh, uh, talented uh, staff member, Christine Reif, who you've met today. She is your uh, contact person. She's your liaison with the agency. Anything you need come to Christine and uh, she'll she'll uh, direct you to the, the proper uh, sources uh, we're glad to have her she came to us from the podiatry associate uh, podiatry examiners and uh, uh, again we're glad to have her she started in September and she's making a uh, she's making doing a great great job for us and we're really glad to, glad to have her um, in addition, uh, our staff's been busy implementing legislation that's been passed over the last couple of years. Uh, it's a pretty intense process. It includes uh, developing and reviewing rules like, like we did today, uh, communicating to stakeholders, appointing and prepping advisory boards, uh, hiring additional staff, and dealing with uh, education exams, IT programs, and more. Uh, majority of the work has been completed. But uh, there is more to do. The process will continue as we implement more programs uh, uh, this year and next. Uh, last fall, our agency was busy doing what we could to help um, our licensees and small business owners uh, along the Texas Gulf Coast recover from the devastation of Hurricane Harvey. Uh, we worked with the governor's office and Governor Abbott's uh, Rebuild Texas efforts. And we're successful in implementing procedures to help uh, all eligible licensees in the affected areas uh, to help them recover and get back to work as uh, quickly as possible. Uh, our Harvey focus now is on the rebuild uh, by protecting small business and, and consumers, uh, avoid unlicensed activity, and ensuring that they receive uh, quality work for their hard-earned dollars. Um, information on all this can be uh, uh, found on our website, tdlr.texas.gov, and on the Governor's Rebuild Texas site. Uh, later this year, we will be, um, since this is a, a non-legislative year, that means that uh, uh, it's time to take on our statute-driven uh, strategic planning exercise. So later <coughs> this uh, spring, we'll be going through that important process again, and you'll be hearing more about that soon. Uh, wanted to uh, again uh, plug our website uh, we refer to it as our window to the world it's our chief tool to communicate um, with licensees with the public and I wanted to uh, share with you again some recent web traffic your your website has been fairly busy uh, over the past six months um, your site has had uh, 11,855 page views that's an average of about 64 per day uh, Seventy-one percent of those folks do it from a desktop computer, while uh, twenty-five percent of it do it from a smartphone and four percent from a tablet. Uh, the top reasons for visiting your site are, number one, laws and rules, followed by exam information, forms, frequently asked questions, and continuing education information. I wanted to emphasize that we're always looking at our sites to make them better, make them more user-friendly, make them more informative. Uh, so it, if, if there's any feedback you guys have, please pass it along to us. We'd, we'd appreciate it. Also wanted to mention, especially to our new folks, that uh, uh, we are on social media platforms. So please follow us on uh, Facebook and Twitter and uh, keep up with uh, TDLR activities and news there. So thank you very much and thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, we'll have an update uh, from work groups uh, and possible recommendations. Uh, joint rules work group. Uh, my understanding, I'll go ahead, Wendy. Wendy Pell, Assistant General Counsel. Um, this work group has not met yet. 
um, kind of getting through these other rules, but we will hopefully meet um, uh, soon. I don't have a set date for you, but left that on there as a placeholder just to give you an update we haven't forgotten. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, agenda item H, assignment of projects for work groups. Uh, first one is standard of care to review and study the American National Standards uh, rule. Under 16, Texas Occupation Code, uh, Administrative Code, uh, Chapter 112 regarding autometric testing and autometric test rooms. Uh, number two, assignment to education and examination work group. Um, review and study the Proctor Requirement Rule 16, uh, Jack 112.25, examination proctors. Uh, and then we'll assign the, uh, the third one to the uh, Licensing work group uh, to review uh, Rule 11250. <clears throat> With um, you know that and the public comments coming. Okay, uh, agenda item I recommendations for agenda items for uh, next board meeting. Any recommendations? Yes, ma'am. Um, Deidre Stewart, I haven't been able to find the answer to the question. With the new um, laws that now, if you have a mild to moderate loss, you can now get hearing aids and not go through a hearing aid dispenser or something like that. There's a lot of confusion about that, but I, I couldn't find anything. Is that going to impact the profession, or, or where's the answer? Okay. Um, Uh, is it going to impact the the profession if a person to a mild to moderate hearing loss goes and buys hearing aid over the counter? Well, you know the new law that passed, the federal law that passed, saying you no longer have to. I'm going to say go through. You only have to go through a licensed person if you have uh, a severe loss, and so now you can buy the over the counter hearing aids. I think the law passed in September through Congress. Yeah, the answer to, to what impact it has on the industry, I don't know that, that will it or will it not from the past. People have been able to uh, buy over-the-counter amplification for, for years. And what impact it have on the industry, I don't know. Well, I was just wondering about the testing and the legal implications for people, let's say, maybe they test and it kind of goes back to the question that we were talking about before if it's not a requirement now to put hearing aids not amplifiers but hearing aids on people with mild to moderate losses are there going to be some legal implications when non-licensed people do that and then what happens oops found out they had a severe profound loss yeah, I think I would, I would direct I'm sorry. that question to legal. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was uh, addressing something else. Sounds like we are having a conversation about a possible future Her agenda, agenda item. Miss um, <clears throat> part of the conversation, I do apologize. Okay. <laughs> but um, you had some concerns you want to address uh, concerning the federal law and over-the-counter hearing aids and so forth um, to discuss it because it's not currently on the agenda and we have to notice everything it's just one of those government things that we have to do or we get in trouble so uh, if that's an item you want to put on the agenda for the next meeting you want to flesh it out and as always if you have other items after this meeting that you want on contact advisory.boards and uh, we will get those items on there but <clears throat> if it's a new topic that's not on here definitely want to address your concerns but we'll put it on the agenda for the next meeting so we can notice it. Okay, we'll move to item uh, J, discussion date and times and location for the next board meeting. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, just to interrupt. Um, back on I, just to let you all know, the proposed rules will be back um, before you on your next agenda along with the public comments we receive, so that will be an agenda item for you as well. And we may or may not have any um, updates from work groups. 
Okay, uh, Nick, would you like to talk? Right. Um, in um, in visiting with our general counsel, uh, we're looking at uh, mid-March uh, meeting date, uh, the week of uh, March 12th, 13th. Um, that's a Monday and a Tuesday. Uh, possibly Wednesday could free up the 14th. Is that a possibility? It's Jesse Rango. Are you saying meetings for all three days, or you're wanting no, no, to no. select a certain select day? Select a day, right. Okay. Options. <laughs> Give me some options here. <laughs> Wednesday works for me. I don't know about everyone else. Wednesday is not available right now, but it could open oh, up. Okay. It could open up, so we can keep that as an option. Is the following week an option? Uh, the day we have the following week would be Tuesday, March 20th. Also, look at Tuesday Friday, March 9th, possibly. Wednesdays are probably it for me. <laughs> okay, this is Ben Norris. For me, right now, it looks like the month, the whole month of March will be out for me. Uh, so I'm going to sit quietly and. We could also do Wednesday, <laughs> March 21st, and we could do the morning of March 19th. So, Mary Winston here, Mr. Provide, Presiding Officer, <clears throat> we will muster forth if you can't make it, um, and of course you'll receive all the documentation anyway, and um, we'll have someone else hit that gavel for you okay. if we can get a date for everyone else to be available. Mr. Rangel is, um, Wednesday's good for him. We do have the 21st of March, as um, Wendy whispered in my ear and Nick just said for everyone here, um, is that a good date or is there another date that the looks 21st? good? The 21st? Is that what you're asking? We're it's looking for the 21st of March. It gives time for the work groups to meet, for public comments to come in, for Wendy to take all those in, review them, prepare to meet with uh, the board again and have this discussion. And we need to do this before March 30th, which is when our commission meets. Yes. To adopt the rules. So. And they're always at 10 o'clock? They do not have to be at 10 o'clock? It's up to you. Yeah. March 21st works for me. Okay. And, and that'll work for me. My, my issue is I drive six hours from here. And do you need it later? <laughs> 10 o'clock is the earliest. Okay. okay. For me. Would you like it later? Uh, it, it doesn't matter. T Ten o'clock's fine be because I I'll drive to Dallas and then stay in Dallas and then drive in. So try to break it up some because I've done the six-hour thing one time and that's yeah. all I needed. That's <laughs> <the point. laughs> it works for me. Yeah, twenty-first is fine. And on the twenty-first, we could do it at eleven or, or no, one. Yeah, no. Ten's fine. So we're looking at Wednesday, March 21st? 7. 21st. Hey. <laughs> 7 a.m. <laughs> so we narrowed down to the 21st? By 10. 10 o'clock? Mm -hmm. Okay, meeting's adjourned.